you've, uh, you've gone and evaluated your model, so you've done the bias variance decomposition, and now it's time to figure out what to do next to improve your model. This is the order that I think you should prioritize improvements in. So start by addressing underfitting. So the first thing that you should do is make sure that you can actually um, get to your target, to your goal performance on your training set, um, whatever that training set is right now, before worrying about overfitting. Um, there are a number of strategies that you can use to address underfitting. The simplest and I think often best strategy to do is just make your model bigger. So make your layers wider or make your network deeper. You can also try reducing regularization, um, error analysis, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a few minutes, um, moving to a different neural network architecture that's closer to state of the art, tuning your hyperparameters, um, or also adding features. But you know, in the, in the deep learning context, like in standard machine learning, adding features is a great strategy. In the deep learning context, like in this sort of paradigm, it's um, usually not what I'd recommend trying. Um, because at least in principle, our networks are supposed to figure out the, uh, the features. So let's walk through an example of this. Remember, our goal performance was 1%. Our training error was 20%, which is terrible. And so the first thing we might do is just add more layers to the ConvNet. That could get us, let's say, to 7% error. Then we might switch to you know, a ResNet, like something that's closer to a state-of-the-art architecture, which could get our training error down to, like, let's say, 3%. Then we might tune the learning rate. And you know, for the sake of example, let's say that that um, gets us down to you know, less than our target error of 1%. And now the big glaring error in our model is that there's a huge gap between our training error and our validation error. So we're massively overfitting our training set. So how should we think about addressing overfitting? Um, again, there are a number of strategies that you can try here. And the simplest and often the best strategy is just, you know, Add more training data. Um, if you can, this is usually the best way to address overfitting. Um, it's not always possible to do this. It, you know, collecting more data is not always something that we have the ability to do as machine learning researchers and engineers. Um, and so another thing you can try is adding normalization, like batch norm or layer norm. Um, these normalizers also serve as pretty effective regularizers. Data augmentation tends to work pretty well as well. Um, and regularization is another strategy that you can try. So drop out or L2 um, regularization. Um, right now in the field, it seems like there's sort of a trend toward um, building models that have a lot of normalization, but not any or not very much regularization. Um, but these are still strategies that you that you that it should be in your toolbox and you should play around with. Error analysis again. I'll come back to what this means. Um, moving to a different, like closer to state of the art architecture can also help with overfitting. <coughs> Tuning your hyperparameters, um, and then uh, other strategies that might be worth trying are early stopping, removing features, or lastly, reducing model size, which can help with overfitting, but is not something that I would recommend in sort of a deep learning way of looking at the world. All right, let's, let's talk through an example of what this might look like. So, um, you know, again, our training error looks really good. Our validation error is really bad. So the first thing that we might do is, you know, remember, remember we are working with a tiny data set of 10,000 examples. So we might try increasing this to 250,000 examples. And that could already, um, you know, make our validation error much better, although it would probably hurt our training error as well. And then we could try adding some sort of um, regularization like weight decay. We could try doing some data augmentation, you know, flipping images, rotating them a little bit. And, you know, and so then now we're back in the regime where we're still overfitting a little bit, but not very much. And so then this is kind of the point where you know, we're reasonably close to our goal performance, both in training error and validation error. And so this is probably the point where I would go and do like a big um, hyperparameter optimization sweep. And so we might tune a bunch of hyperparameters, and that could be the thing that would allow us to get both our training error and our validation error into our um, into like kind of our desirable range. Okay, so once we've once our model is um, is kind of our training error and our train validation error are both sort of in the region that we want them to be in, then the next thing we might um, go and do is try to address any distribution shift that's present 
And distribution shift, there are fewer strategies to, um, to addressing this. But some things that you can do are um, you know, looking at the errors that your model makes on your test validation set. And this is, tends to be a very manual process. But looking at those errors and then saying, you know, what are the, the generalizable mistakes that my model is making on the test validation set? And how can I go back and collect more data that will allow my model to figure out what to do on those cases where it makes mistakes? You can do a similar process, but not actually go back and collect more data. Instead, you can synthesize more training data to compensate for that. Or lastly, you can apply some domain adaptation techniques. Um, and you know, domain adaptation techniques are a useful tool. I would say that they're still a little bit more in the research realm than they are um, things that are production ready. OK, let's, let's talk a little bit more about this error analysis process. Right, so how do you actually um, look at a data set and, and um, try to use the mistakes that you're making on that data set to, um, to prioritize data collection? So let's say that you know, these are examples of mistakes that our model is making on the test validation set and the train validation set. So these are places where there is a pedestrian in the image, but the model did not detect it. And let's see if we can categorize these in some way. Um, well, we might notice that, you know, for example, there's a couple of errors here, both in the test validation set and the train validation set, where it's actually just really hard to see the pedestrian in the image. And so maybe we couldn't have reasonably expected the model to perform well on these, on these images. Um, it seems like there's another category of errors that comes from reflections on the, wind, on the windscreen, um, which is both in the training and the test validation sets. And then there's a third type of errors here that um, only is present in the test validation set, which is night scenes. Right? And so our conclusion from this might be, you know, well, one reason we might be overfitting to our training distribution is that we don't have enough data at night. And so. Um, I just wanted to show an example of how you might sort of systematically analyze these errors and use, them, um, use that analysis to, to draw conclusions about where you should improve. So uh, remember, we have this error type of hard to see pedestrians. And so you might look at like roughly what percentage of the errors on your train and test validation set cause from, or come from this type of errors. And then you might also look at what are potential solutions to this problem. So for hard to see pedestrians, you know, really the only solution might be just to like get better sensors. And so this is you know, a relatively low contributor to your total error. And it's also like the potential solution seems really hard. So we might say this is a relatively low priority place to, um, to intervene. Reflections, you know, maybe this is a larger contributor to our train val and test val errors. Um, but we also have more uh, potential solutions here because we can just go and collect more data with the reflections. Or we can try to synthetically add reflections to our training set um, or we could also go the other direction and say, let's try to um, detect when we do have reflections and synthetically remove those reflections using some sort of pre-processing. And so maybe this is like, um, you know, a little bit easier to address and a higher contr contributor to error, so we might give this a medium priority. And then lastly, nighttime scenes, very small contributor to our train validation error, but large contributor to our test validation error. And um, our potential interventions here are you know, the, I think the, the simplest and most effective would be to go collect more data at night. But if we can't do that, then we might try to synthetically darken our training, our training images or simulate nighttime data or use some sort of domain adaptation technique. And so this would probably be the one that we would prioritize. Um, I want to say a few words about domain adaptation, but I'm not going to go into details about it. Um, so what is domain adaptation? These techniques allow you to train on some sort of uh, source distribution. Um, so some distribution where you have access to a lot of labeled data, and then generalize to another target distribution using um, typically only unlabeled data, or often just a limited amount of labeled data. Right? And so when should you think about using this? Well, you should consider this when you have access to, um, when you have very little access to labeled data from the test distribution, but um, you have access to a ton of data from a relatively similar distribution. And um, I think it's also particularly important, like, useful to consider this if you have access to tons of data from your test distribution. It's just really hard to label. Because right? that's, I think, the place where these types of techniques can shine. There's a couple of different types of demand adaptation. There's supervised demand adaptation, when you have 
limited data from the target domain. And so the simplest example of this is just taking a pre-trained model and fine-tuning it. Um, but you can also do things like adding target data to the training set. Um, and then there's many more complicated techniques as well. And then there's unsupervised um, domain adaptation, where you have lots of data from your target domain, it's just not labeled. And techniques um, in this category are things like correlation alignment, domain confusion, and cycle gain. And these are the techniques that are a little bit more in the, the research realm. All right, so there's one more step that you need to do um, to improve your model, and that's if you need to, rebalance your data sets. And so when should you think about doing this? You know, periodically when you're training your model, you should check your error on your actual held out test set. And if your test validation error looks significantly better than that test error, then that means that you've overfit to your validation set. And this can happen if you're doing like a ton of hyperparameter tuning or you've just been working with this validation set for a really long time. And then if it does happen, then the recommendation is just to you know, resample your validation set. Um, ideally, you can go collect new validation data, but even just reshuffling the validation and test data a little bit can help. All right, any questions about this? Do the bias variance strategies also apply for autoencoders? Uh, yes, yeah. Um, but it's a little bit harder to measure when an autoencoder is performing well. Which methodology do you use to come up with these error categorizations? So coming up with the error categorizations is a bit, I think, more of an art than a science. Um, I think things that can help here are like building good internal tooling to help you sort of go through your, um, go through sort of validation and test, um, validation set errors and training set errors more quickly and efficiently. Um, but really this is gonna be super domain specific. How to check the uncertainty of the model that is performing well on individual examples? Not sure I understand the question. Why normalization is preferable over regularization? Um, I think normalization is like more in vogue right now in the deep learning community. Um, I think more state of the art models recently are going to like a normalization only approach where they don't have dropout, um, they don't have L2 normalization, but they do, do have like batch norm or, or layer norm after every single layer. And empirically it seems like those types of strategies can work well as regularizers as well. And, uh, but with fewer trade-offs in terms of like um, being able to, to sort of quickly fit, um, you know, uh, fit a massive training set. Do we have to use a fixed random seed when we're trying to address the overfitting, underfitting, assuming that we keep the training the same? You don't have to use a fixed random seed. I do recommend um, at least building the capability to use a fixed random seed into your code base, because, um, but mostly because that'll help with reproducibility, um, less so because it'll help you debug. Someone posted in the Slack, I guess a tw Twitter post from someone trying to re-implement a reinforcement learning method and changing the seed and then not getting the results. Yeah, um, in reinforcement learning, it's, uh, reinforcement learning methods are like particularly sensitive to hyperparameters, including the seed. So um, yeah, if, if you're trying to, to re-implement reinforcement learning papers, I would say just stick with the ones that you know, people kind of tend to know work relatively well and are relatively robust. And someone joked on the Twitter that uh, the random seed is another hyperparameter. Yeah, but that, exactly. I think that's actually true though. It is, yeah. yeah. So could be some to uh, hyperparam. How do you detect when you're optimizing the wrong objective? I don't know that you can detect this from any sort of metrics that you'd bet. So I guess if you have like, if you have some other sort of metric that you're, that you, is the thing that you really care about but you're not optimizing directly. So for example, you know, the simplest example is um, you're, um, you're optimizing cross entropy but you really care about accuracy. Um, then you should look at that metric that you care about and if that's not improving when you're, when the thing that you're optimizing is improving then you should ask yourself whether you're really optimizing the right thing. Um, I think there's sort of a harder question, which is like, how do you know that the thing that you care about is the right thing to care about? And 
that's, I think, that's more of a judgment call, and I don't think the numbers can really tell you that. Um, on, like, I think maybe the place where the numbers could tell you that is if you are deploying things into production and are able to track sort of like the downstream impact of, um, of you know, how, how your North Star metric affects like, uh, you know, like the business outcomes that your model is producing. How to go about intelligently labeling unlabeled data, especially image data like segmentation? Um, I think we covered this more in the data labeling lecture. Yeah, I don't want to talk about labeling. Maybe the question is, how do you find, like, which examples should be labeled? Mm. Um, yeah, there's a few strategies here. I think, um, you know, the one sort of simple thing to do, and um, this I think can be effective, is to look for examples that are hard for your model. Um, so if you have sort of some sort of feedback loop implemented, then you can look for places where your model is making a mistake. Um, if you don't, then you can just look for places where your model is not very confident. Um, and uh, then you can you know, go back and label those examples. And last question. It was mentioned that early stopping is not recommended, but the labs do use early stopping. Are there cases where you should use it? Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, I have mixed feelings about early stopping. I, I actually, I think I changed my recommendation. I think early stopping is worth considering. Um, I think the, the thing that I don't recommend doing is um, relying on early stopping as a way of, you know, as, as essentially your main technique to reduce, uh, to reducing overfitting. Um, because I think that usually there's just more juice that you can squeeze if you are more principled about how you reduce overfitting. Um, but if early stopping is just kind of a way of, you know, being practical and not, you know, wasting training cycles when your validation error is not going down anymore, then I think that's a, a good thing to do. Great.